Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next uh, uh, sequence of visiting professors here, and I'm excited about uh, our current visiting UVA alum. Um, but I'm going to have uh, Dr. Thompson, who knows him very well, uh, introduce him and uh, listen to some great talks. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Greg Thompson. I know I think most everybody here. Um, I, I was just telling the residents, I don't get this turnout when I give my tumor lectures. So you should feel very honored. Dr. Gibbs is a good turnout for everybody. Um, we could, I can introduce Dr. Gibbs for a long time. I've known him since I was a fellow. I did my fellowship at U of F from 2005 to 2006. We have a grandfather and a father and a son here with Max. We all, but all of us trained with, uh, under Dr. Gibbs, so it's a nice lineage. Um, Parker uh, was an undergrad here. You said you graduated 84? Really? 94? 94? Yeah, yeah, graduated 94. Um, and uh, went through uh, uh, medical school tumor training. He has been working in the fellowship for years. He was doing bench research basic science research on osteosarcoma when I was there. He does clinical research. He was the head of the cancer center. You were the CMO of the hospital of Florida. He's now the chairman of orthopedics um, in Florida, which, but he's just a normal guy. Trust me, normal guy. Don't be impressed at all. Um, and, and a great, a great uh, mentor for me and a great person to work with. And I think maybe in, in regards to your second talk, you know, one of the real benefits of academic medicine is, is working with people like Parker and having a long-term relationship with people that you've worked with and trained with and, and you see, and you can bring back and spend time with. And um, it's one of the real blessings we have uh, as academic physicians. So I'm um, happy to have you here um, and let's do it. Thank you, Greg. And everybody, thank you so very much for having me. Um, it's always good to come back to the hook, right? It's so called the hook. They probably don't know that, but... Okay. All right. It's an old name for Charlottesville, um, which is a cool place. So I'm going to figure out whether I want to stand in front, move this thing. Maybe I'll do this. Um, so this first talk that I'm going to give you guys is kind of a orthopedic oncologic technique uh, tour. Um, it's a data-free zone. Actually, I'm going to give you two talks that are data-free zones, okay? So um, hope you're okay with that. Um, let's see, down or up? Here it is. I have no particular disclosures. I wish I had disclosures. I used to have disclosures, but the royalties expired, and so now I don't have any disclosures. This is actually a uh, gross photograph and an X-ray of an Egyptian mummy with the first known osteosarcoma that we've ever dug up, right? So orthopedic oncology goes back a long, long way. The first written descriptions of this, um, I am gonna stand up here, was by Abernathy uh, in about 1804. And you can see, I like this slide just because of the pictures, right? Um, You've got, this person has probably got an atypical lipoma. This person, on the other hand, with all the venous distension and all that kind of good stuff, uh, definitely has some kind of high-grade sarcoma. So they were starting to talk about sarcomas uh, in the literature that early. Um, you guys heard of Alex Boyer, right? Uh, he coined the term osteosarcoma in 1805 in a treatise called Diseases of the Bones. Dupuytren's hand guy, right? Uh, not really, but he dabbled in hand stuff and bone stuff and injuries and all these other things. He looks a little bit more like Napoleon than Dupuytren in this picture, um, but also talked extensively about neoplastic diseases process in the bones. So there's an early interest in bone sarcomas. When Dupuytren's wrote about it, I'll leave this up for just a sec because I... I enjoy the way they wrote. Anybody ever submitted a manuscript to CORE? Craig and I lived through that several years ago. CORE is the most ridiculous dictatorship of how we write ever. 
And I would love to live in the day where we could write like this. A week before her confinement, she complained of acute pain and da 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 da, da. But this is um, the story of Marguerite Maybeal, who was a foundling, right? Who says that? At age 21, she developed a tumor in her knee. And then she got uh, pregnant and her confinement, the time she spent waiting to have her baby, um, it got better with uh, her pregnancy for some strange reason, and then the disease made progress following uh, her delivery. And superficial veins, it increased a foot in diameter, uh, let's see, it had superficial ulcerations that were in contact with the pillow on which it rested. Such graphic descriptions, right? Um, the catamenia, anybody know what catamenia is? And it's like all the blood and byproducts postpartum, right? They're pain meds were prescribed, but she soon afterwards died in excruciating torment. I would love to write a paper that they'd let me use words like that. But anyway, I just kind of like that paragraph because it explains what old time people wrote about in cancer. So we moved on to surgical descriptions in the late 1800s by a guy named Sam Gross, who should be a name familiar to most people and wrote a treatise about sarcoma of the long bones with 165 cases and recommended early amputation, even though there was a 30% perioperative mortality at that time. And it was heavily witnessed, right? So that's them gross, everybody's cutting off a leg. And limb salvage was universally fatal at that time. In the 20s, we had our first kind of tumor society. You don't operate to die. You do operate, they die. And gentlemen, this meeting should be concluded with prayers. This is where we were in 1920, right? This is the specialty that Dr. Hoggard has decided to embrace and move forward with. Enjoy that, Max. There was a time of history that started in orthopedic oncology and modern history at the University of Chicago. So many orthopedic departments around the country can trace their lineages back from the University of Chicago to these two people, Dallas Femmerster and Howard Hatcher, neither of whom were actually orthopedic surgeons, right? But they started doing things in orthopedics. Femmerster was a general surgeon. Anybody know what the Femmerster technique is in bone grafting? Okay, all right, YouTube it. Um, or TikTok it before it becomes illegal in this country. So Dallas Femmister talked about filleting bone and getting little tiny strips of bone off of tibias and doing little tiny uh, kind of matchstick type of bone graft. Uh, he was also one of the first persons to open reduction from fixation in this country. Hatcher was actually uh, double trained and was also a pathologist. These two guys trained uh, a group of surgeons that eventually became orthopedic surgeons and between the two of them in the course of, uh, gosh, from 1954 to 1958, trained eight people that went on to be orthopedic chairs in the United States. So it was the, the Chicago Mafia is what they called them. And they went out and distributed. They became chair at the University of Florida. They became chair at the University of Iowa. They went out to California. It was a big group of people and it was heavily populated by tumor doctors. Um, no, there you go. Um, I don't even need this slide anymore, but those are the kind of names. I don't know if you guys uh, recognize any of them, but those are all giants in the world of orthopedic surgery. Bill Enneking, uh, who uh, was the father of orthopedic oncology in the United States. Now, Dr. Mankin right below him would say that he's the father of orthopedic oncology in the United States, but he was a year behind. So Enneking started in 1960 and Mankin in 61. Von Figlio uh, did a lot of tumor work at Iowa. Eugene Mendel went to Buffalo, was also a tumor guy. And Mary Sherman, uh, one of the early, early women in orthopedic surgeries, became a giant starting out of L.A. Uh, and I'm missing a couple people. But this is kind of the nidus of that group. Dr. Enneking, uh, we talk about legacy, at least I was introduced here just a minute ago, as a grandfather for which you will be beaten soundly on the golf course for doing that to me. Um, but it's true, we can all trace our roots 
uh, way back. I mean, if you talk uh, about any of us who do fellowships, you can see sequences. Tumor surgery is a little weird because there's so few of us. Uh, but Dr. Anna King, this is him going to a ball game with Mike Simon. Dr. Simon was one of his first fellows. And Dr. Simon went back to the University of Chicago where he trained me. Right. So Anna King trained Simon. Simon trained me. I trained these two guys. Right. So it, it's a, it's kind of a neat history. Uh, Dr. Anna King passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Simon's still with us. Uh, Dr. Simon, these are a, of a different age of people. I'll tell a little story about Anna King later on. Uh, Dr. Simon, uh, as nice as he looks there, we told a story last night, you know, he was classic for making people cry. We'd walk into rooms and he'd go, well, I can save your life or I can save your leg. You make up your mind. And then I'd walk around as a fellow with a box of Kleenex and go, I just really didn't mean that. Right. And he was about this big. And, um, and then you go, well, what'd they choose? Ah, shit, they're going to die. So anyway, um, one of the other names that was super important in the evolution of orthopedic oncology was a guy named Mario Campanacci. Uh, the Rizzoli Institute in Italy is probably the largest, most famous orthopedic oncologic program in the world. And Mario was the founder there um, and really... Uh, was the guy that started defining things like amputation levels. Because up until the mid-70s, the only thing we did for these diseases was cut, was cut people's legs off, right? And it was a dramatic change when we moved to limb salvage. But Campanacci and Anna King uh, made their names in various forms of amputation and actually wrote papers saying, okay, you cut this high, you cut this high, you got this high, right? It wasn't exactly rocket science. But it was based, it was the things on which we based margins in the development of all our staging systems that we enjoy today. So Dr. Simon uh, and Dr. Mankin and a couple other folks uh, in the 80s were the first to describe the success of limb salvage surgery and osteosarcoma. And it, what it looks like is so uh, survival at that time was about 50%. Um, and the standard of care was either an above knee amputation or a disarticulation of the hip for distal femoral osteosarcomas. And they pioneered the uh, limb salvage idea, like I said, in the mid to late 70s, and found that the uh, limb salvage was basically not inferior to amputation for uh, survival in osteosarcoma. So this was 1986, it was probably one of the biggest landmark articles that changed how we all practice orthopedic oncology because up until now it was considered unsafe to do limb salvage surgery. Coincidentally, this is also possible because in the late 70s, that became the ad advent of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, right? So if you look at survival rates, say in osteosarcoma, if you do surgery alone, amputation, it's a 20% survival rate. 80% of people die. That's because everybody has microscopic metastatic disease at diagnosis. And so only 20% of people don't have microscopic metastatic disease at diagnosis. And those are the ones that are saved by amputation. With the advent of chemotherapy, you can kill microscopic metastatic disease. And then amputation survival went up to 50, 60, 70%. And we got similar uh, numbers like that with limb salvage surgery. So without effective adjuvant chemotherapy, this paper never would have happened. And so now I have to get credit to the internists and the pediatricians, and that really hurts me. Um, but that's this was a landmark article that changed what we do. Now, limb salvage at that time was not the same as we do now, right? Now we grab things off the shelf and we put heavy metal in people. Uh, we saw some heavy metal yesterday that Dr. Domson put in somebody that was curious. Awesome. Curious. Yeah, we'll ask you to show those pictures in five years to see what that looks like. Um, but this, I, I imagine I might get an update every five minutes at this rate. So limb salvage began with autograft. Um, and these are kind of kind of some fun history pictures. So uh, again, around the knee, a guy named Paul Shirley and Dr. Anna King wrote this paper. Um, and this was actually prior to the, the big paper about distal femur. 
but we did some wild stuff, right? So this is a tibial turnup operation. So you can see that um, you do a resection of the distal femur, you take the top of the tibia, here's the cancer, uh, you put a Samson nail down the middle of it. Anybody know what a Samson nail is? Yeah, it's an indestructible device. I've taken three of them out. I would like those 46 hours back. Um, yeah, they're impressive, but they go in at the, at the piriformis and they go to the ankle, right? And they're this incredibly thick, dense, fluted nail with sharp edges that bites everything all the way down. Um, so they strike, put that down, then you uh, take out the anterior cortex of the tibia and you slide that up and you affix it uh, between the distal femur and the proximal tibia uh, and get this kind of fusion rate. And so these, this was a tibial turnip operation popularized by Dr. Enneking. Uh, and oftentimes they would save the patella and use that for autograft addition to it as well. So that was limb salvage, but it was all arthrodesis, right? So the mobile knee was much later. You can do that for, um, it's just a different view of it. And this, uh, again, uh, taking bone from another part, taking it up here, circlaging it around the nail and getting that to fuse. There's just another. This is where they added a fibula. These are all, um, these are non-vascularized autograph fibulae that they would add to get fusion across the space. So in this case, the Samson nail does not have a tibia, but only has double-barreled fibula on this side. This is the tibial turnip on this side. Bilateral, non-vascularized autograph fibulas were also used to reconstruct the humerus, right? So I don't know about you guys, but the uh, ORIF performed here looks a little hmm, anemic, I think. But the surgery looks pretty cool, right? God knows what they were doing in there. But they laid in two autograph fibulas, uh, did something up on the top and fixed it to the distal humerus with this robust fixation and threw in some tricortical iliac crest for good measure, just to hope to get all that to heal. I've actually never seen the long-term follow-up of this x-ray. I only have this one, so I don't know if it really worked or not, but it's a really kind of cool picture. So allograft stuff came a little later. Um, now, allografts were known for a long time. The, these two guys in the red hats are Cosmos and Damien, uh, who in the 1400s, uh, transform, transferred an allograft lower extremity to a dying uh, priest uh, whose name escapes me. That's his leg off in the bucket. And they got uh, a, they, they talk about this, the transplant of a moor to the priest's leg as the first allograft that we have documented. I don't know if it worked, but, I'm, you know, but it makes a great picture, right? I think this guy died. So, but allograft surgery now has a long history, right? So, and, and it's fraught with difficulties, right? All sorts of ancient hardware doing things. Uh, but the idea behind allograft was that it was readily available. It was abundant. Um, and allografts worked very, very well for intercalar reconstructions, not so well for joints. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but this is like a total hemipelvis allograft. I've done several of these. They do poorly, right? An infection rate for this operation is upwards of 60% and going on to formal hemipelvectomy. Um, I tried to get the picture. I've got, uh, I'll steal it from Cherry Peabody, University of Chicago, one that we did, where <clears throat> the bowel eroded over the top of the allograft and spilled stool all over the allograft. And then they did a barium enema to document where everything went. And they've got this picture of an arthrogram of the total hip via a barium enema. There's some weird stuff that happens with these. This is an allograft arthrodesis of the shoulder with a funky plate that clamps to the scapular spine. Obviously intercular allografts are where they're most strong, right? That's where they really work. God knows what kind of intercular mess this is uh, to the hip. And then there are things about allograft prosthetic composites. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Allograft biology is interesting. Um, you know, we put these massive allografts in people and they heal about that much. So these three papers um, 
all three of them out of uh, Gainesville, uh, and and then Eugene Mandel and Dr. King did this uh, together um, out of Buffalo. Uh, for the residents in the room, this is actually a pretty cool paper to read. I know it's like 400 years old, 1991. Um, but it's, a, it's an incredibly classic article that talks about the healing of allografts and describes their junctions with host bone. And what you find in allografts is you get about a three to four millimeter penetration of new bone at each end of the allograft if they heal correctly. And you get a little tiny bit of appositional new bone on the edges. Now, what's kind of cool about these three papers is they're based on a clinic of practice, an academic practice that we can't do anymore. So how many residents in the room feel like you get scudded by your chair? He's not looking, he's in the front. Do you all feel loved? They hold your hand and take you through life. We're gonna talk about that in the next talk, right? So Dr. Anna King would send his residents from Florida to South Florida, to Georgia, to Alabama, to funeral parlors, to harvest the allografts on people that he operated on who had subsequently died. Sometimes he got permission from the family Sometimes he didn't, but these residents would go off in the middle of the night to freaking funeral parlors and harvest femurs from people and stick a broomstick in there and sew them up and disappear back into the night. So this is, you guys think you got it bad now? Come on. Anyway, three papers, a lot of fun. OA allografts. Um, OA allografts were enticing, right? We're going to put an allograft in and replace your joint. It's covered with articular cartilage. Oftentimes, it has ligamentous attachments that, that theoretically will heal to the host bone that you're going to put it into. Uh, and one of the areas that was very popular was the distal femur. But as you might imagine, the distal femur is a complicated geometry, right? The, you know, you've got one side of the proximal tibia that's convex, another side is a concave. You're putting in somebody's donor bone. You're matching this by x-ray, which is like not accurate at all. So really you create bone stock, you get some knee stability. Uh, but when you put these in, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, not really, um, because then you have to sew up the posterior capsule and the PCL and the lateral medial capsules and the lateral medial collateral ligaments. And then you sew the ACL and then you reconstruct the extensor mechanism. So once you put the bone in there, you've still got another hour and a half of sewing crap to crap, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like posterior lateral corner reconstructions, right? You get some crap here and you get crap here and you sew them to get any sports doctor. Right, I've never, I, somebody identify those structures. It's, um, it's about like that. And this is what they look like over years, right? So this was put in in 2002 and it's put in with a rod. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, fixation of allografts. Um, I won't go into that today, but you can see that the allograft kind of fits, medial lateral kind of fits front to back, uh, but it's a dead piece of bone and it never lives. And the problem happens that sometimes in the big metaphyseal and epiphyseal areas, you get collapse right? Because you get some revascularization. So revascularization of an allograft is bad. So actually you want the thing to stay dead forever because when they revascularize, they get weak and they fracture, which is really why we never do this operation anymore. And we never do proximal humerus allografts anymore that are osteoarticular because the revascularization process causes them all to collapse. So how do we get away? What do we do next, right? So here's just one in the tibia. And you can see the arthritis. This looks like Greg's knee. Greg was describing his knee to me today. Uh, he has a total medial, medial meniscectomy. It probably looks like that. But I, I am impressed by the congruence of the patellofemoral joint there. I think that's just amazing. That's the biggest osteophyte I think I've ever seen. But um, this is what an osteoarticular allograft does on the tibia, right? The junction healed fine, but you're left with this, right? And then you have to convert them to this, right? So I did this operation a few years ago. Um, and it was a lot of fun for me, right? But it's, um, and the patient's doing fine, but it's it's a big operation to do. But we saved her. She, we use the allograft uh, bone. So we end up, she's got, uh, this will probably be her last operation. Um, so what do we do now, right? So we talked about allografts. We talked about uh, autografts. And since about the mid-90s, we've adopted the KISS principle. 
Everybody knows what that is, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Because taking out tumors is hard enough, right? The resection part's hard. So we want the reconstruction part to be easier. And what we do now is put heavy metal in people, right? Don't ask about this story. This was a bizarre story and a very sad one. Um, we talked about the lack of our ability to do osteoarticular allografts in the shoulder. And we started replacing that with um, humeral endoprostheses, but we didn't, we weren't able to stabilize the shoulder. And so that's where we use a lot of allograft prosthetic composites because we could sew in the rotator cuff off the allograft. And that worked for about six months and they all became unstable again. So most of us are putting in reverse uh, proximal humerus reconstructions, right? So this is that thing I used to get royalties on, so I won't name it, but we think it's kind of cool. Um, but the reverses have really changed dramatically how we take care of proximal humerus uh, sarcomas because now they're stable, their motion still stinks, but at least they aren't chronically dislocating. So talk about a little bit of stuff that we're doing now. Um, and I'm going to give, I told you this is going to be a data-free zone, but I'm going to give you a little bit of data. Uh, in the last five years, uh, that's not true, the last four years, we've done 19 uh, pelvic sarcomas using this device. Uh, this is kind of like the equivalent of a harmonic scalpel. The bone scalpel device, is, it operates like a cast. Anybody used one? Yeah. So it, it, it theoretically doesn't cut arteries, it theoretically doesn't cut nerves, it only cuts bone, right? And it allows you to make these curvilinear shapes and do all sorts of cool stuff in, in uh, cutting bone. And we get really uh, creative in what we're able to resect and what we're able to say. Um, custom jigs, we can now order, oh, back to the data. So we've done about 19 of those things. Um, and we've had using this combined with navigation, uh, one positive bone margin out of 19 in the pelvis, which is, um, pretty dramatically better than, than it's been in the past. So these two devices and navigated osteotomes have really changed our ability to operate in the pelvis. And I'll show you some examples of all this and how it works. Um, so this is one of our early uh, experiences uh, with navigation. Uh, so this is a guy who had a MFH of bone uh, or UPS of bone. You can see this kind of destructive lesion here in the anterolateral cortex of the proximal tibia. Uh, we saw x-ray extra yesterday it looked a little bit like this. Um, and it was a big surface-based lesion, right? Um, eroding into the tibia. And, you know, historically, you might try to do an intercalary allograft here. You might try to do a proximal tibia here. You might do some kind of blind cut and hope you got past the tumor. But we're doing these with navigation devices now in which, you know, you put some kind of anchor here. You put these little um, funny little balls in here and you got a camera that takes pictures of everything and tells you where you are. Uh, so you can put guided instrumentation in there. Uh, this is a guided saw, right? So the reference points and then the reference points on the saw. First one of these I did, I said, oh, aren't those little balls cute, cute? And I touched them and then we had to redo the whole thing. Um, so I know all you total joint guys know all about this stuff. Uh, the tumor people, we're late adopters, um, but it's kind of made it really cool what we can do here. And this is just the imaging Talk, sewing the uh, saw cuts here, projecting and where we're going to go uh, live and making those cuts. And then what you get out of that is a really uh, uh, minimal destruction resection, saving as much host bone as is humanly possible. There's the big defect. Uh, and then you fill that back up with cadaveric bone, right? And put a big plate and screws on there. And then you do something with the patellar tendon, which is completely unimportant. Um, but that's what it looks like afterwards. This person had a gastroc flap, probably. Uh, this is my partner's case. And not bad, right? I mean, it's a nice juncture for an allograft. And these are the kinds of allografts that heal fantastically, right? You've got half the host bone there, a lot of blood supply, uh, and these all go on to do very well. Others don't so much. So if you decide to get really fancy with some of this stuff, you try to take the planning of these osteotomies uh, away from yourself. Right, you go, I'm gonna send this off to a company and they're gonna tell me what kind of cuts to make and I don't have to think anymore. Uh, now, why anybody feels, this was a paper uh, by Wong and Wong, uh, and I, it's like 10 years ago now, um, and their first description of these custom generated jigs 
was this cut where they made a perfectly straight cut here in the diaphysis of the femur and another perfectly straight cut here in the distal femur. I don't know about you guys, but I don't need navigation to do that. But this was the first paper that started talking about the concept and how they did this, right? And these are what those jigs look like and they're custom cutting guides and they cost a gazillion dollars and then they put some abomination and turquoise thing in there. Um, but this started it. Now, a guy named Healy, who's a crazy guy up in New York. Anybody know John Healy? I know Domson does. Um, but uh, John actually wrote a really good paper about uh, using these in, in real life cancer uh, and with, with goals of decreasing bone loss. And uh, so you use CTs and MRIs and you use the images, you send them off to the company, the company sends you back these jigs that not only tell you how to cut bone, but then you reverse them to tell you how to cut your allograft. And I'll show you how that works. It's kind of a slick little deal. So here's an example. This is one of our guys with a destructive lesion of a distal femur, obviously. And classically, this person would get a distal femur resection or reconstruction, right? But this is all edema. You've got good MRIs. And you might imagine you could make this cut if you knew where you were. So these are the kind of pictures that are generated, sent off to some unnamed company. There are several of them now uh, that show the tumor, the reactive zone around it, where you want your custom cutting jigs. And I'll point out here that early on, we have sharp corners here, right? Sharp corners in bone cuts are not good. So that's where later on this bone scalpel critter comes in to be very important because you can make curvilinear cuts uh, instead of these sharp angles. And I'll show you why that's a problem. And then this is what the uh, cutting jigs look like and they're anchored by various pins, right? Um, and they all look like little stress risers to me, but kind of like the compress that Dr. Thompson likes to use. And it outlines the kind of cut you're gonna make. And then they do all this stuff and this is what you're left with, right? Um, and again, sharp corner right here. Can't imagine what might happen there in real life. Uh, and indeed, so here's the actual case. And you anchor your cutting jig here in the distal femur. And it tells you where to cut. And you run your saw down this guide and take it out. And this is the defect. And here's the fracture we could have predicted on the, on the, on the imaging ahead of time. right? I mean, there's a nice guide wire right there at the fracture site. Uh, we like to show our first complications. It keeps us humble, not that we're already, you know, not humble. Uh, but you can see here the epiphysis remaining in the cut. Now, the, and, and you can see how close you can get to a cancer and still have a good margin on it by using these devices. I think the coolest part of these is using the reverse jig to cut your allograft. Because now fashioning your allograft becomes a 10-minute procedure where before fashioning these allografts would be an hour-long procedure and fashioning and refashioning and just you know, like trimming sideburns, you keep cutting and doing that kind of stuff. So you have the model that shows the defect, you have the model that shows the cutting jig, and then you cut the allograft to fit and then you put the allograft in and you plate it and you get a great fit. And I apologize, I don't have the picture uh, of the intraarticular split but it wasn't bad. It wasn't perfect because we have to remember there's a kerf to these and anytime you use a saw. And so uh, we've accommodated for that now, but in some of these early cases, we did not. Uh, there it is. That's the picture I did. And that's the problem with these. And we've gotten better at that, which you might imagine that's an arthritis generating machine. But if you can restore bone stock like that, then if they need a knee in 10 years, at least you've got a whole femur to do it. And you don't have to replace the distal femur. And that's what that looks like. And there's the fracture, obviously, that went on to heal. 3D printing of custom implants um, in the pelvis, I don't do them. So we'll just say that people do them. I don't do them. And I think they have a long way to go before they're going to have anything more than two-year follow-up. Right. You might imagine if you replace the whole pelvis and this is your fixation across the front, this fails. The infection rate on these is also very, very, very high. There are people doing them. Um, I'm not going to get on that curve. Right. I'm going to be a couple steps behind the curve on these 3D printed pelvis reconstructions, but people do them. Um, like a little bit about navigating in the pelvis. Um, so this is a Ewing sarcoma of the pelvis that responded dramatically to chemotherapy. 
This is his pre-op pre-chemo imaging. Here's his post-chemo imaging, and you can see it's really only in the posterior ilium. And this is where navigation has really uh, revolutionized our ability to make safe cuts in the pelvis, because now we can navigate. We'll put uh, the probe uh, reference points in the part of the ilium that we're going to save. Right? We're not going to take it out, and you'll see it makes a really funny X-ray later. Um, and then we navigate, you reference your uh, cutting devices. This is that scalpel that we talked about. Uh, and then you navigate live. This is a navigated osteotome uh, that we're using in this case. But you can see exactly where you are relative to the SI joint, exactly where you are relative to the sacral foramen when you're making these cuts live. Now you have to trust these, right? The first one of these I did 10 years ago. Uh, I did this and then I looked in the wound and I was like at least three centimeters off from where the damn machine told me I was. That's a little disheartening. So it took me a while to come back to it. And since the navigation's gotten better, we've done most of these over the last five years. But you can see the very precise cuts you can make, taking the lateral sacrum, preserving the sacral nerve roots and still keeping a margin. And in this particular case, we had to take the SI joint with the tumor to ensure our margin because the tumor invaded the sacroiliac joint. And then there it's out. This is a KISS principle reconstruction. I showed you a 3D printed pelvic reconstruction. This is a tibial allograft that we're bolting onto the remaining sacrum and the top of the acetabulum. And that's what that looks like. Again, robust fixation. This is here, remaining ilium, because that's where we put the anchor for the navigation. Looks kind of silly. But it allows us to keep the sartorius and a couple other things attached there for function. And then these kinds of allografts, uh, despite the fact that they have a massive shear force here at the sacrum, do pretty well. Now, this is a fairly recent picture. Um, and never trust anybody that gives a presentation where their last picture they show you still has a drain in it. Okay? I'm very guilty of that. Uh, so I'll show you one that's got like 10 years follow-up with the same reconstruction. Um, but you can see this is uh, minimal hardware. And again, this kind of tibial strut allograft between the top of the acetabulum and the sacrum. Uh, here it is just showing preservation the, of the gluteal vessels, the hole, uh, where we put that in and what it looked like immediately post-op with the drain. And here he is eight years later, right? So he, he obviously had screw breakage from shear, uh, but he lost no real height. I mean, you can draw a line there across his uh, lessers, whoops. Um, and so sometimes, and in fact, oftentimes in these massive operations, uh, simple is much, much better for the reconstruction, right? Because they're on the table a long time. You want to decrease the operative time and tried and true things really work. So this kid actually went on to play soccer in high school and did really, really well. Um, the other place where navigated surgery in uh, this world is important uh, is in the world of sacral chordomas, right? So if you guys, for the residents in the room, uh, this is nothing but, I mean, it's hanging off the end of the sacrum, uh, pre-sacral soft tissue mass. This is almost by definition uh, a sacral chordoma. This is our pre-op planning. That's where the uh, sacral uh, biopsy was done. Tumor extends left and right that far. We're going to avoid the tattoo, um, but you can see here again, live imaging of, okay, skip that. You don't know who she was, um, of the uh, live imaging of the guided instruments, both the uh, bone scalpel and the osteotomes. And in this particular case, we were able to dissect out. So this is uh, S3 uh, nerve roots coming out this way and that way. And we were able to make a cut transforaminally there, uh, exposing those. Uh, and this is, you know, bowel and bladder. And so take those, dissect out the nerves and hope she retains bowel and bladder function, which she eventually did. But we probably would have been a lot less successful and have to go a whole level higher without navigated surgery uh, in this case. So uh, a lot of nerve preservation. And then my last navigated case, because uh, I promised you guys I'd keep this like under 45 minutes, um, is some of these periacetabular lesions, uh, which we used to do blind, right? So I do periacetabular lesions. I put a giggly saw in the sciatic notch and bring it out above the ASIS or AIS in between the two and make a cut of the pubic ramus uh, and then do something. But when you've got like this medial wall sarcoma here, um, you can do some cool stuff with navigated surgery. They're doing a surgical dislocation of the hip, 
Uh, we're going to do that. And then we're going to navigate this. We're going to use this silly bone scalpel here. We're going to take out only the area of bone that's involved. And you can see this nugget of sarcoma here. It's a small chondrosarcoma, the medial wall of the acetabulum. And we're going to take just that wall of the acetabulum. And then we're going to put a jumbo cup in here with a couple of big screws up into the ilium and the posterior column. Um, and this person is now about two years out and doing great. So these navigated surgeries really have lessen the morbidity. I don't think they've done anything for survival, but they really have lessened the morbidity of the surgeries that we do. So in summary, we're really late adopters of other people's technology. We're great copycats, but we use it in kind of cool ways. This is a real case. It really, really is. This was done like a long time ago. I didn't do it. I have no idea what the follow-up was, but it's a freaking awesome x-ray, isn't it? All right. That's all I got for this first little lecture. Any kind of comments, questions, rotten fruit, tomatoes kind of things? When Anna King um, was at the end of his career, they had um, they had like a little, um, not even like a ceremony at the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society. And they said, oh, get up and say a few words, you know, Dr. Anakin, you're about to retire. And, and uh, he got up and said, <laughs> I hate the IRB. <laughs> That's what he said. So he literally went off on the IRB for about five minutes in front of the whole society and sat down and said, you know, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, so he, he, uh, he would inject patient A's tumor into patient B's leg without IRB and the first form of immunotherapy. Right, they thought immune therapy was going to, you know, cure everything. So every osteosarcoma patient got inoculated with the previous osteosarcoma patient's osteosarcoma. <laughs> he had the greatest slide set, which they wouldn't let me take. And uh, you know those pictures in your review book where you have like the metaphysis, the epiphysis, and it shows you all the stuff. It looks like this little miniature bone. He actually had those that he would go to the, he'd go up to the OBGYN abortion and he'd take the fetuses and make slides out of the digits. So you had the whole little aborted fetus bones phalanx as a slide. So you saw all the epiphysis and then the physis and everything on one slide. You can't, you can't get that slide anymore. So he, he wouldn't let me have that. So I should say that's not good. Uh, no, 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 no. He was like, no, you can't have that. But it was just a good time. There was a different time there. He was in, a, you know, the, those personalities, you know, this room named after one of those type of personalities, right? I heard a story last night. Uh, I don't know if he sent Russ out to steal body parts out of cadavers, but all right. Well guys, thank, thank you so much for this. Yeah. Thank you for a fantastic history lesson and some amazing cases. You know, we're seeing limb salvage being done more frequently. Obviously you showed early on amputation was the only option. And even with amputation, there was a high mortality rate. Now we're doing a lot of sexy surgery with computer navigation and a lot of implants. And and obviously, Greg is using a lot of implants that uh, that we may not all agree with right now. But based on case presentations yesterday, but um, the, is there immunotherapy? Are there any advances you see that are going to be non-surgical related? Currently, I mean, we hear about it in lung metastatic lung cancer, people living longer because of immunotherapy. Is there going to be anything like that for osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma or any of these high mortality tumor, musculoskeletal tumors? Yeah, so I think the immunotherapies and sarcomas have not proven to be very effective. And that's really because um, the PD1s, uh, Keytrudas, things like that, that, that have been revolutionary and almost curing lung cancer and curing lymphoma and curing melanoma, uh, the mutational profile sarcoma is not the same. And so they don't have these epigenetic markers that the immunotherapy uh, drugs target. And so I think the next wave of efficacy in non cytotoxic chemotherapy and sarcomas is going to probably uh, rest around targeted gene therapy uh, because we do have some uh, fusion proteins. We've got some really good specific markers of these tumors uh, that differentiate them 
So uh, targeted therapies delivered by viruses like AAB uh, depend on having something that is different than self, right, to be able to target. And historically, if you don't have that, then you get these horrible bystander effects, people die of widespread toxicity. Um, but I think as we develop tumor-specific epitopes on surfaces of these cells or identify them, uh, we're going to be better at doing that. Uh, but the science is bad right now. It's not, you know, you've got people talking about being able to identify circulating osteosarcoma cells in the blood, and then you talk to them, that's all based on size, right? That's a great big cell, therefore it must be cancer. I mean, it, it's really kind of gross level stuff. Um, so as we be as we become able to target probably RNA uh, targets in these cells, we'll be able to do it better. But why we have a ways to play. So, but the you know even with limb salvage scenarios, you mentioned micrometastases are often already present. Yes, and that's why there's a high mortality rate yes. in these young individuals. So the the next step would be some sort of targeted gene or yeah. immunotherapy, right? To, right. to, to to uh, stop these micrometastases. Yeah, and there's actually a lot of work being done that, you know, tumors um, exhibit anti-inflammatory effects or an anti-immune effects. They, they, in the local environment, they suppress the immune system. Sarcomas are particularly adept at that uh, and actually generate, because we've got actually in my lab that talks about, they actually generate mimics of tumor cells, uh, sorry, immune cells to get the body to think that you know what, well, we're already taking care of this. Now that's teleologic thinking, right? You're, you're attributing evil to a tumor, which they're not, but damn, they're good at it, right? They, they adapt survival. So I think um, immune therapy will likely eventually figure out something with sarcomas, but we don't, because all the immunotherapies now are not specific immune modulating specifics that, that, that target highly mutable tumors. So pulling tumor, Pulling inflammatory T cells out of a tumor microenvironment, throwing them co culture and the tumor infiltrating sites, those kinds of things are promising. And I can get it to work in a dish, I can't yet get it to work in a patient. So that's like CAR T cells, you probably heard of those too, revolutionize some of the ways we treat them. But sarcomas are tough, they really are. What, how many, uh, we do a lot of limb salvage, we do a lot less amputation. How many? Patients, do you think we lose as a result of that? How many people die because we do limb salvage? Right. If we amputated everybody, we'd save more people than if we did limb salvage on everybody. So, what do you what do you think? How how many patients think we? I mean, we don't do it. They make the decisions, obviously. But what what do you think the numbers are there? So, if you just do it by local recurrence rates, which is the only approximation you can probably use, right? So, if you look at distal femur. Above knee amputation, local recurrence rates are about four percent, even with an above knee amputation. Hip disarticulation, local recurrence rates are zero. Distal femur reconstruction, local recurrence rates about seven percent nationally in the United States. So probably three out of a hundred. Just simple math. Uh, it's a little higher. Most people will accept that three percent increase in mortality. For keeping their leg, I will. So, and, and I'm a pretty big proponent of just because we can doesn't mean we should. So I, you know, most orthopedic oncologists say we save 90 percent of our extremities with limb salvage. I'm probably in the 85 percent range because I think we probably ought to do more amputations than we do because they're so much more functional. Right? We were talking yesterday about TMR and all those kinds of things we can do now to make amputations better. The prosthetics are a lot better. Um, I have a young gal, I'll show a picture of her in the next talk, um, who, when I was in Denver, um, I did a proximal tibia osteoarticularity graft, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I was a junior surgeon. I spent 400 hours putting this thing together, and she had you know, 110 degrees of motion, and her knee was stable. That's a huge win for proximal tibial osteoarticularity graft. But she was in the hospital at the same time with a young lady who had a snowmobile star and her popliteal fossa who I did an AK on. And the gal that had the AK went on, on track in high school and rock climbed and all these cool things with her carbon fiber blade. And so Megan, the young lady that had proximal tibia, spent two years talking me into chopping off her leg. It took her two years, but I chopped off her leg. Right? 
and she's doing great. Now she's a PhD in karate uh, black belt, and she's getting married on May 18th. And I'm trying to figure out if I can actually go to Chicago either. Um, so, which is another cool thing about orthopedic oncology, right? So, we know how old I am. So, she was 10 when I did that operation, and now she wants to go to her wedding, right? So, that, that's really cool. We get to do really cool things, and we get to know families, and, uh, and they never go away, right? Sometimes that's good. <laughs> All right. Any endoexoprosthesis? Are you guys doing any of those down in Florida? You? I'm close, but no. Okay. Yeah. All right, babes. Next talk. Coffee. Next talk. Next talk. Just go. Um. Let's see if we can. Hmm. All right. So this is another data-free zone. Um, when I was invited to talk up here, they said, give a talk about, you know, cancer surgery and give a talk on something much more soft and fluffy and wellness and work-life balance and things. And, and I, I balked at that a little bit because I'm terrible at it, right? I'm terrible at it. And so... The purpose of this talk, uh, and I apologize a little bit because it, it's a talk about kind of how I went through my career, um, which I hope doesn't come across as like hubris, um, but what I learned out of it, right? And maybe if you guys hear some of the things I've learned, then you don't repeat the mistakes I've made. And I'm going to talk about it from an academic perspective. And I know 90% of the people in the room are not going to go, of the residents are not going to go into academic medicine. But I think a lot of these things are applicable in almost any setting in which you end up practicing. This is my disclosure. So balance. Yeah. Yeah, this is what we'd like to see, right? And in reality, this is what work life balance is. I, I just... Yeah, there, there I am. That was my first job right there. Out, boom, done. So, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, lovely picture I showed in the first thing is, is where we'd all like to be. And, and there I am at the end of my career running to retirement, right? Okay. Um, but, all right, how do I get this? There we go. Okay. So I think work-life balance is something you strive for all the time. As long as you're striving for it, it's a good thing. But I think we have to understand that we probably, at least in professions like these, uh, it's tough to get to. So my career early on, you know, I like to think I, well, I don't like to think, I know I peaked in high school, right? It's been downhill since then. I was a terrible basketball player. Um, thought I was going to be there until I showed up here as an undergrad and went, oh, that's what basketball is all about. Thought I was uh, going to be a, you know, professional golfer at one point. That that was obviously a fail. And I'll demonstrate with Thompson later. I was an actor. I did a lot of shows here as an undergrad, uh, sang all that stuff, but that didn't go anywhere either. Um, failed at being a marine biologist. And most importantly, you know, I damn near failed out of UVA my first year. You know, rush at UVA was nine weeks. Nine weeks, four nights a week for nine weeks. It takes a long time to bring up a 2.6 GPA. Um, but one summer back in Gainesville, I grew up in Gainesville, I met that guy, right? We talked about Dr. Anking earlier. And that's how I got into orthopedic oncology. I was working summers mopping floors in the OR. And, you know, he was there. I didn't really know what he was, but he's about six foot five, right? He's a huge guy. And you know, look eye to eye with Max. And he would do hip disarticulations with three cuts, Right, you take these amputation knives and, and the leg would come off. Now, he had some resident and some fellow, all the people with clamps, like clamping everything that was bleeding before the patient exsanguinated. But he knew, for some reason, the kid mopping the floors was thinking about going to medical school. And he looked around one day and he said, Gibbs. I said, yes, sir. I had no idea he knew my name. He said, I hear you want to go to medical school. I said, yes, sir. 
And he goes, well, here, this is what it's all about. And hands me the leg. So I, I'm given, I've never touched this, this gory, dripping blood out of the femoral vein, right? Warm thing he just cut off. So take that to pathology. And so here I'm dripping blood all the way down the OR hallway because I don't know enough to put in a bag or anything. Anyway, so that's how I decided I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon and an orthopedic oncologist. So I had to fix all of this, right? Because there was a lot of failure here. Um, so how do you recover from that? Well, you bust your butt in undergrad for a while uh, and you get into medical school and then you go do this stuff. And, and my career after all that was kind of an example of Brownian motion. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the surgeon scientist deal, the detour that I did to administration and my return now to orthopedics. So I came out, my fellowship was three years long, mainly because I was stupid. And the second year was really just remedial. But the third year was in the lab. And actually the last two years were in the lab. And I got to meet a lot of cool people, right? And in science, unlike most orthopedics, you get to see people from all over the world that have completely different ideas than you um, and are very, very different from the classic orthopedic surgeon, right? Um, and that challenges you. It, it, it engages your creativity um, and gives you an idea that maybe if you do something really cool in the laboratory, you might actually make a difference more so than just doing one operation after the next. At least that's the pie in the sky idea about research and being a surgeon scientist. Turns out it's not quite as easy as all that. Um, but why would you not want to be a surgeon scientist? Well, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. It's humbling on a daily basis because you work with people that are much smarter than you. Uh, your friends do laugh at you. They're like, hey, we're going to go play golf. And you're like, yeah, I got to run an Eliza. Da, 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 da. Um, surgery is a full time job. Research is a full-time job, right? And so that you add those two together and you oftentimes have better things to do on the weekends and you're not there. Um, my first job when I left the University of Chicago was at the University of Colorado. And they brought me back there to start an orthopedic oncology program. They'd never had one, right? Um, there were five hospitals. Uh, that I worked out of. They wanted me to establish an oncology lab and teach. And I said, I'm on it. Well, this is called hubris, right? Talking about my career might be hubris, but thinking you right out of fellowship can do all of this and cover these hospitals and do all this, that's hubris, right? And so that failed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how it failed. So these are the sites of practice in Denver where I worked, right? So here, nowadays, this is the uh, Big Fitzsimmons campus. Uh, this was the downtown campus, this was the Children's Hospital. This was Rose Hospital. And this was an outpatient surgery center. Uh, but I used to make rounds at the VA, the county hospital, the Children's Hospital, the University Hospital, and this private hospital every day. Because uh, I had like one patient in each stupid hospital. That is not a recipe for success, right? And, and as a junior faculty member, I was like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And uh, you can't and run a laboratory. You are all over the place. And even localized to the main campus, right? Uh, this is where my laboratory was, right? In this little tower. This is a walkthrough place. Uh, there's not an orthopedic surgeon or another surgeon scientist within 800 yards. They're all housed in this building. This is the big research lab. And so they stuck this newly minted orthopedic cancer kid in a, in a little tiny laboratory, which is very well equipped. Uh, and I saw it at least two hours a week, right? Because I was running around all these other hospitals. And when I was there, I was not anywhere near the people that were doing the research. So I was all by yourself, right? So that also... Um, didn't work. So there was one thing about that. So in your first five years of practice, which is, that's how long I was there, it was five years, um, you learn a lot about how to operate, right? And I would say, and I don't know about the rest of the attendings in the room, but those first five years, you need to learn to operate and learn how to take care of patients. And it's, um, 
critically important. And I didn't realize that until, you know, I came to Florida afterwards, but those were critical formative years for me. I didn't have a fellow. I almost never had a resident. I had a medical student sometimes, but you learn how to operate and you learn how to do it on your own. And, and the learning curve is, is super, super steep. Um, so I wouldn't trade that failed five years for anything in the world. I really would. It was amazing. Uh, this is Megan, by the way, the young lady is getting married. This is the young lady that had the amputation. This is a young lady with a limb salvage, that's her compression stocking on. And this is an osteoarticular allograft of a proximal tibia. Um, they all got together and had that portrait made for me. But anybody know what the empty tile syndrome is? Or do that? So the empty tile syndrome is all OR, all ORs uh, back in the day had tiles on the wall, ceramic tiles, right? And you go out and you get your first job and your eyeballs up in some complicated horrendioma surgery you don't know how to do. And so you look or behind you looking for your attending and all you see are empty tiles, right? And that's that whole five years. So I would encourage you as you guys get out into practice, wherever you go, to focus on that first five years as an extension of your training and really learn to hone your craft. And after that, you're probably pretty damn good, right? And But the bottom line is you learn forever. I've been doing this for way too long, as I've said, and I still learn. So what else did I learn in Denver um, that helped me going forward? So isolation is bad, right? And that's very, very important if you're going to be a surgeon scientist. It's very, very important, actually, if you're going to be a surgeon, either academic or clinical. It's it's tough. Being on your own in the middle of nowhere with nowhere to talk to or no buddies to bounce ideas off of is bad. And so I would, I would very much advocate for going someplace where you've got some friends, right? I failed to identify a mentor. This may be the biggest thing I failed at, right? And so in my career, I have worked very, very hard to fix that both for me and the people I teach. Um, you want to make sure that you're what you're doing, whatever institution you're at, that the projects you do, both clinically and academically, align with stuff other people are doing. The synergism is real, and doing stuff completely off the wall by yourself is oftentimes doomed to failure. I did this without a clinical partner, right? So you're trying to do research and clinical work without anybody to backstop you. We talked about the geography. Uh, we talked about this being more than full time. And we talked a lot about being stupid enough to think you could do it, right? Um, there's some perverse reality equations when you talk about FTE, right? Um, all of the faculty in the room are assigned an FTE. That's your effort. And it's assigned you're going to do X percent clinical. You're going to do X percent teaching. You're going to do X percent research. So if you have an FTE of 0.5 in research and an FTE of 0.5 in clinical, that's an one and a half real time right? Because neither of those ever turn out to be a half an FTE. And they always go to 0.75 productivity. So you lose productivity switching from discipline to discipline. And I'll talk a little bit about that, I think, in the next slide. Uh, not next slide. So biggest fail, finding a mentor. I didn't do it. So it's critically important in residency as a junior faculty, maybe even further, to identify someone who you can talk to, right? Who understands your issues. And you can have mentors inside your department, outside your department, outside the institution. They can be anywhere. They don't have to be in your specialty, right? But they need to be able to talk about the trials and tribulations you're going through and how to advance your career. And it's not just in your work life, right? Your personal life can use a mentor too. And so the success of, of a mentor often just depends on the who and not the what. Um, I like to think that I've been a reasonable mentor to people. Uh, oh, and this guy. Uh, this was my primary scientific mentor for probably a decade. This guy named Dennis Steinler. The neuroscientist. You know, does brain tumor stem cells and cognition research. But he was the kind of guy that if you walked into his office and you feel like you're just like going to jump off a building, you walked out of his office thinking you're going to cure cancer for the entire world, right? So those are the kinds of people um, that you need to find to help you get through your career. And without him, I would have been able to do none of the stuff I've ever done. 
So mentoring is a process. Um, some of you may have seen this picture of Max. Um, so this is Max's career. I took part of this much of it, right? He was with me for a year. Now, I think the impact I had on Max can be seen here. I, I think I, I think his mouth turns up on the corners there, right? Look, he's smiling now. So this is Max when he shows up. This is Max when he's leaving. So I would like to take credit for getting Max to smile at least that much. Right? Other mentor-mentee relationships are more difficult and challenging because when you start here, it, it, it's really hard to get here. And I, and I would argue that perhaps I failed here because um, I still think there's a whole lot of Kramer in this guy right all right so when you go look at a place so if you're going to an academic place you're looking at the chair if you're look, going to a clinical practice you're looking at the guys that run the practice and they're very important because they've been there for a while they know how things work right and so choosing a place it's important to know who the boss is Right. It really is because they're the person that's going to control your life or at least control your ability to control your life. Um, and in the academic world, when I was trying to do research, I came to this guy named Peter Guerin, a total joint surgeon, and Mark Scarborough, who was his, the chair after him and my partner. Um, if you're going to do real research, it's time. And so any of you thinking about that, when you talk to the chair, you need to talk about time and you need to talk about real clinical expectations and somebody that believes in what you're doing, right? I've talked to a lot of people that go into academic careers and they take jobs and they talk to the chair and the chair goes, oh yeah, 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 we'll, we'll find some time, right? Uh, and, and we'll find a place. That's great if you're gonna do standard, most of the kind of research we do, right? Which is clinical research and we do it on nights and weekends and that's fine. If you're going to do bench research, though, and so this doesn't apply to a lot of us, this is incredibly important, right? It needs to be locked in because that really takes time. And then they talk to you about salary. And when I got my first job here, what they did, so PhDs don't make as much as MDs, right? And when you do a research job, you're doing PhD work. And so they pay you like a PhD. So I got for my Time in the lab, I got paid a PhD salary, and my time in the OR, I got paid a doctor's salary. Right, uh, that is haunting me to this day. Right, my four hundred one k is not as big. Um, but again, uh, not only does the chair need to believe in the mission and advancing the science, your partners need to do that, and you have to have your back and you have to have theirs. So when I first, you know, in the middle of my scientific career, these characters, uh, Andre Spiegel is my current partner, Scarves is still there. Um, and Dr. Chung, who's now in Singapore, um, Dr. Chan, Chung Ming Chan, uh, a brilliant microvascular hand surgeon that's also a tumor guy. So I had lots of help on the clinical side, right, to back me up when I wasn't there. And you need that because, if, as I told you, when I was in Denver, I was it. I was the only clinical guy. And you're still trying to run a lab, and that just doesn't work. Um, and you have to have partners there. Right, you have to have research partners. Patty still works in my lab. Steve Gibbs, Annie um, was my research mentor, along with uh, Dennis Steinler. And then this is a crazy mechanical aer aerospace engineer. That's a whole other story. Uh, but these are the kinds of teams you have to have, um, and you have to say thank you. So, if for those of you who work with real scientists, um, go in there with a dose of humility and say thank you all the time. Many PhD scientists get into clinical departments and they fail because they end up doing the research for clinicians, right? And that's a bad, bad recipe. So respect them, say thank you all the time when they help you and they teach you. Um, and in the clinical part of this, if you're trying to do both, um, remember that patients come first, right? Science is great, but on a day-to-day -day basis, patients come first, right? Your partners come next. You got to treat them with respect. Uh, and be honest about your clinical skill. We talked about that first five years, right? Be honest about this. Um, when I was the CMO, one of who we had a young surgeon who was a scientist in a different department, and that doctor uh, ended up leaving. But 
came to me, we have problems with clinical quality. And I asked that doctor, I said, she's two years out of fellowship. And she was 50% time in the lab, 50% clinical. I'm doing these big cancer surgeries. And I said, so how's your clinical? She goes, I'm great. I'm better than my senior partners. That kind of stuff doesn't fly, right? Because they're too junior. They're not spending enough time. It's the same reason doctors make bad pilots, right? We're arrogant and we don't have time to practice. So you got to remember that your clinical life is important and get the practice. Um, and you're asking favors a lot. And nobody ever laughs at this. I really think this is a really funny slide. Um, if you're trying to do two things, if you're trying to do administration and uh, clinical work, if you're trying to do practice building and clinical work, if you're trying to do science and clinical work, beware of some things, particularly the half day, because the half day never turns into the half day, right? It, it, it creeps. Uh, the morning clinic goes till two o'clock in the afternoon, right? The um, add-on case that's supposed to start at 1 p.m. doesn't actually get started till 3 p.m. So you lose time with these kinds of things. Uh, and so one of the things I was able to do at Florida was the plug and play doctor thing, because I had three partners who I trusted who could do the work that I could do. And we talked to patients ahead of time and say, hey, we're a team. And 95% of the time you're gonna get me for good or for bad. But this 5% of the time you might have to deal with one of my partners because I'm stuck in a laboratory someplace. And as long as you tell people that up front, it works pretty darn well. Um, and you really can't do it all, but you'll try. Um, I talked about expressing gratitude. You need in, in research, um, if you're gonna succeed, there actually does need to be time to reflect and think. Right, it's not all running a pipette or running the PCR machine or running samples. There has to be time to read and to think, and you can't do it all on nights and weekends. You can do a lot of it on nights and weekends, um, but you need to spend some time uh, to do that. And and your clinical partners will look at you and they'll say, "What are you doing? You're sitting there reading articles all day, right?" It's critically important. Um, and then when you're working with the scientists, be there when they're there, right? Because they're not there at six o'clock in the morning, right? You are, but you also need to be there when they're there and don't be a jerk, which a lot of clinicians are, unfortunately. Um, the other thing about surgeon scientists is um, you're doing this part-time and the scientists who are probably already smarter than you are doing it full-time. And they wake up every morning and they think about it and they think about it in the shower and they think about it when they're eating breakfast and they think about it when they're at work and they think about it when they're at the gym. They think about it all the time. You don't and you change gears. And I hinted at this a minute ago, but that changing of gears from thinking about your scientific world or your administrative world and then your clinical world you lose efficiency because your brain doesn't, it's multitasking in segments and you lose that continuity of thought that these people have that have single mission kind of jobs. So doing these multi-mission things uh, is, is tough. And so, you know, get favors, work with people. Um, and I talked about that. You have to recognize and be honest that there are competing interests. These are two people that work in my lab. You can tell that they're not working very hard. Um, but, you know, you have competing interests that are all valid. You know, your, your lab effort, or your administrative effort, or your practice planning effort are all important. But you have to remember people are probably the most important. And so your patients says this should come first. They are competing interest. Your clinical partners are competing interest. Your research partners, your productivity targets, right? Whether you're academic or private or private academic, everybody's got productivity targets. Your family is critically important, but it is a competing interest. They want your time and they deserve your time, right? And so you have to plan for that. You have to admit, okay, I can't be in the lab and in the OR 100 hours a week, right? It doesn't work very well. You have to make time for friends uh, and you have to make time for why we're all in academic medicine for teaching residents and fellows and medical students. And finally, you need to make a little time for you, okay? So these are all incredible. And you look at this, you go, how the hell do you do that? And I have no idea. I just don't. 
It's because I fail all the time at one version of this or the other, right? So this is where we talk about work-life balance. And it looks like that rodeo instead of the little double thing right this. So if any of you guys ever figure this out, please call me because I'd love to. Um, this is how I started my research career. Um, that bench is what, three feet wide? Uh, the one that actually worked in the neuroscience lab. Um, Olga was my first laboratory tech and she was brilliant and saved my life routinely. And you lean heavily on people like this. But this is the thing that generated my first NIH grant. Um, Steve Givazani, who uh, was my scientific mentor in addition to Steinler, uh, helped me write grants. Grant writing is an art form. It's a story to tell and it has to be told in the right way. Uh, and it's incredibly difficult because it's a story that has to be backed up with data and you can't lie. You can embellish, but you can't lie. Um, the first grant I ever wrote, he marked it up with red ink. He only got halfway through it with the red ink. And then he write, wrote at the top of the page, can you please show me some depth of knowledge in bright red ink with exclamation points. That was my first grant. It got funded in R21 eventually, but only after I went back and spent like two weeks rewriting the damn thing, right? So you need people, if you're gonna do research, who are gonna be really honest with you about your skill level and what needs to be done to improve your skill level, much like you need clinical mentors to be brutally honest with you about your operative skill level and your clinic skill level and tell you where the heck you need to get better. Because telling you you're great and giving you the participation trophy doesn't do anybody any favors, right? If he had done that with me, I never would have been funded. So why did that succeed eventually? You talked about isolation when I was in Colorado. This is my lab at the University of Florida. Right. And so this is my academic office. There's a PhD here. There's a PhD here. Um, you guys will remember that this is the uh, Anna King Ansbach study room right there. And then this is my laboratory here. Right. Um, this is a cell culture room. Here's a bunch of other rooms with mass spec and PCRs. And here are some other PhD offices. So when I was writing grants, there were five PhDs within. 20 feet of me, all working on viral vectors for arthritis or viral vectors for cancer or cancer stem cells, all within uh, spitting distance. And then up a floor and up another floor and up another floor, just stairways were another hundred people that worked on similar things. And so these hallway conversations you had are probably the most critically important thing we ever did because it wasn't written. It was like, hey, I'm thinking about this. What are you doing? And it was incredibly productive. Um, so the R21 got funded. So people know about grants. Um, R21 is a high risk, high reward grant from the NIH. It's only two years um, and you're expected to produce a lot of data so that you can then try to get an R01, right? So I got a uh, stop children, a, a local foundation grant to start. And then the R21 got funded. And the next one was a bear. The next one was a bear. So anybody thinking about going into science, this is what it looks like. 24 months, 12 applications, 11 rejections, five the NIH told me I was crazy. Bank and Coley is a Florida state grant rejected. The Department of Defense grant rejected it. The Valvano Foundation, NC State, um, rejected it twice. This is an evil, he's a great guy. It's an evil foundation. The only thing I ever got out of the Valvano Foundation <clears throat> is I understood politics. Right. And how their grants are funded or by who, you know, and I was actually invited to Jim, um, not Jimmy V, um, Dick Vitale's house uh, down in South Florida because uh, they had a big fundraiser with the Falvano Foundation. Uh, and they asked all the people that are writing grants to come. We all wrote a check for a thousand dollars and nobody ever got funded. Um, but it was kind of fun. I got to meet a lot of basketball players. Um, and the American Cancer Society rejected it. So a lot a lot of friendly red ink. And so you can see here's the, you know, so about how old I am. So here's the foundational grant, uh, spent a number of years generating data for this grant, right? And these are dollars. Uh, and then another two years writing lots and lots and lots of grants and finally the R01 hit, right? Uh, and so my R01 lasted five years. Um, and then I bequeathed that research effort and grant writing to some other people uh, because something else happened. So we talked about a meandering career, right? So you would think, okay, well, this guy finally got successful as a clinical researcher. Um, oh, wait, next slide. Um, 
Yeah. So if you end up being a surgeon scientist or an administrator or a practice administrator or anything like that, uh, you're going to have to give up some stuff. Um, and it's OK. Right. You're never going to be where you think you're supposed to be all the time. You're going to miss some stuff you think you should be because you've got to be other places and people won't understand that. Uh, you're not going to be the as teach residents as much. And you may not be that go to surgeon anymore because you got other obligations. Right. And that's the one that really hurt me a lot. Right. To go for like a decade. I was the guy that something really awful happened. They go give it to Gibbs like the old Mikey uh, life serial commercial. Um, and now my junior partner's that guy. Right. So when stuff really hits the fan, they call him. They don't call me and it hurts me. Right. But it's OK. Um, but this is the kind of stuff you do. Right. To generate stuff that may be life changing. And so we've got a couple of patents on this. This is the end of the, the science stuff. So we developed three dimensional uh, analysis of osteosarcoma, looking at how osteosarcoma behaves in three dimensions and culture. Uh, and its interaction with immune systems and its interaction with drug screening. And so now we can try to propagate individual patient drug screening. So if um, Max gets an osteosarcoma, we can biopsy Max's osteosarcoma, grow it in addition, test a dozen drugs against it all at the same time instead of doing mice. So we'll see. I doubt we'll get rich over this, but it may actually make a difference to somebody. So like I said, I thought I had this plan. I was going to be a surgeon scientist. Um, keep going. And we were excited about that. And then came this thing, this tap on the shoulder thing. I would be really careful about this, right? Especially as a junior faculty, I'm no longer a junior faculty when this happened, but I'm mid-career here. Um, because senior level people are great at identifying people who can get things done and making them do more stuff, right? Like if you want something done, you give it to a busy person. The problem is some of these things that make you give up other things, right? So if somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, you know, like, can you do a small thing like fix cancer, right? And this goes back to that hubris thing again. So here I've got this well-respected guy that I looked up to, taps me on the shoulder and says, Parker, cancer is the most disorganized pile of crap at the University of Florida right now. Can you take over the clinical enterprise here and fix it? Uh, okay, right? But that means that I dogged around the lab and had to bequeath the lab to somebody else because this was another full-time job. And uh, I did that for a couple of years and we made some pretty big strides in the organization of cancer at the University of Florida, got some offsite clinical facilities, did outpatient chemotherapy, organized the surgeons, they would talk to the medical oncologists, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and got it halfway there. Um, and two years later, that the boss of the boss of the person that tapped me on the shoulder on the first time tapped me on the shoulder the second time, October 31st, Halloween, 2016. I'll never forget it. Worst day of my life. Um, and asked me to do all these things, right, all at once. And um, that's crazy. That is crazy, right? That's stupid. Uh, but I, in my stupidity, said, sure, I'll do that. So don't do this. Just, just don't do this. This is called failing up. And eventually you hit your Peter principle. You know what a Peter principle is? Peter principle is rising to the level of your incompetence. And then you stay there, right? So this is my Peter principle. Let me tell you, uh, I did some good things here. I did some good things here. I did some good things here. I did some good things here, but I failed a lot of levels of this stuff. So there are fun things to do when you get into big administrative jobs, right? Like build hospitals. So we added, this is the thing I did my first two years. Um, this is the hospital I operate in most of the time, but we built this heart vascular neuromedicine tower, you know, 350 beds, 200 of them are ICU beds. It's a lot of fun. We built a hotel back here, uh, which you can see. Uh, this is not yet happening because we've got this guy that has a little tiny house on this piece of property and refuses to sell it to us. And we're the big evil empire and he's still there. So this is to be built. But so these kind of things are fun, right? We acquire hospitals, we build hospitals, we do big stuff. Um, that's fun. And then there's fun and hard because then when you've got all these other hospitals and institutions that you now own and you're responsible for the quality in those institutions and these doctors don't work for you. 
right? And there are a bunch of private docs that they expect the University of Florida docs to come in and tell them what to do. Not, right? Now, some of them are great. These guys were great, interested. These guys were great and interested. These people, oof, anybody ever been heard of the villages? Villages is the largest retirement community in the United States, 175,000 people over the age of 55, the highest STD rate per capita in the entire country. Right. It's an interesting place and the doctors are more interesting. The most recent article ever read at either of these two hospitals is 1992. Right. That was fun. So you learn a lot about how to deal with people in these jobs. And it's kind of fun and interesting, but it's kind of hard. Anybody remember what this is? Right? So I was chief medical officer when COVID hit. That sucked. Everybody else got to go home. I think I worked for like, I don't know, 180 days straight. Um, some things are just hard. The two years of COVID probably taught me more about people than the entire 50 years of my life before that. Right. COVID was a crisis that hit all of us. Right. And, and it's um, if you're running hospitals, uh, it was particularly hard. Now, Gainesville, Florida was New York. Right. But we lost a lot of people. A lot of people died. And we did a whole lot of juggling of doctors going home and doctors coming into work and orthopedic residents working in the ER and the ICUs. And I mean, when you start putting orthopods in the ICUs, it gets scary. Right. I mean, we don't have from people. So this was just hard, but I learned a lot. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I learned in just a second. Um, but these jobs, these kind of higher level administrative jobs, and even lower level administrative jobs, I think are important for us as a profession. And I would admonish you to be part of it, right? If you want to be at the big C-suite, that's great. Um, if you want to participate in surgical governance of your local hospital, that's great. If you want to be on things called like the medical executive committee in your hospital, that's great. If you want to do quality operations work for the institution, not just your own world, it's great. If you want to be on capital committees, that, if these are just examples of things that I would suggest all of us do because orthopedics, as much as we like our shiny buildings like you've got here, which is amazing, right? We have one too, although it's getting old and dusty, so I'm going to talk to your boss and find out some new tricks about how to make it better. But we get isolated a little bit. We have our surgery centers, right? We're out here. And that means the main campus doesn't see us very often, right? Unless we're doing tumor surgery or massive revision joints. So you become out of sight and out of mind. And then whether you're in private practice or in academics, you need to make sure that you are present at the institution level. So they remember who you are and remember um, that you're valuable. Because if you're not at the table, you're on the table, right? Okay, that's a little preachy, but I think it's important for orthopods not to get lost in our um, surgery centers or outpatient clinics. We have to remember that we still depend on hospitals and there's a lot of dollars in hospitals and we'd like them to like us. So these are just, so this is COVID learning. Um, you need first and foremost to be worthy of trust. Right. You need to be worthy of trust and then you need to be able to trust other people. But this is critical. I learned this the hard way. Right. I trust people on face value and COVID taught me a lot of that. I had a lot of friends that turned out maybe not to be trustworthy during COVID. You need to listen to people. Um, again, COVID was especially poignant, but it goes to every day. People have different perspectives than you do. Everybody has a different perspective. Anybody seen that Cleveland Clinic video um, about, what's the name of it? Um, but it basically is, it's about a perspective and, the, and they show patients and doctors and therapists and janitors and everybody walking through the Cleveland Clinic and, and they have little bubbles talking about what they think, what they're thinking, right? Like they have the escalator and the guy coming up the escalator is all excited because he's having a new baby, right? And the guy going down the escalators you know, like this because he just got diagnosed with terminal cancer. And you don't know that. So you don't know what people are going through in their lives. And you don't know that unless you ask and you listen. And so asking and listening is important. And then if you're in a leadership position, empowering those people and delegating things. 
because that's how people grow, right? And I'm a horrible delegator. I'm terrible. And I have to make myself do that so that people grow. Otherwise, they don't. And you have to encourage. And embracing conflict is interesting. Uh, obviously, COVID had a lot of conflict. Being an orthopedic chair has a lot of conflict. Being a CMO has a lot of conflict. And you have to learn to embrace that, right? And realize that that also is a way to advance. Because without conflict, it gets really boring, right? So there is a thing called healthy tension and healthy conflict, and you be able to uh, deal with that and, and use it to your advantage, and then above all, communicate. Most folks are good. Some are misguided. Some are just bad. Mistakes happen. Please don't make them twice, right? It's okay to make them once. Learn from others' mistakes. That's what this talk is about, right? Um, me, personally, I'm often wrong, and I'm often right. Um, I'm both. And you can learn from anyone. So this is what I learned the most from a couple of years of COVID right here, these things. Um, I haven't changed this list much, much since I first made it. So wrap up a little bit. Um, some other advice. Uh, this is a book called The Medici Effect, obviously. And The Medici Effect is, is, a, is a book. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know, it's 150 pages. And the concept of the book is that the intersection of disparate disciplines create great leaps in science, in education, in clinical care. And if we're all just in our same little boat, we tend to make advances very incrementally, right? But if you talk to somebody in a completely different field, oftentimes you will get great advances. And so this video, that I hope works, so this is, let me tell you what this is. So this is a ball of osteosarcoma growing in a suspended media, right? So in three dimensions. And, and the reason that's important is that cancer growing in a two-dimensional Petri dish bears no resemblance to real biology. If you allow it to interact with itself in three dimensions, it does. And then all these green little dots are activated T killer cells. And we can watch T killer cells go into the cancer ball and try to kill it. And you can see them, they're actually absconding with various individual cancer cells um, and taking them away. Now, that's kind of cool, but it's a two dimensional picture, right? And we're going to do a lot of experiments on this, trying to decide what makes killer T cells invade cancer, what drives them away from cancer. A lot that gets a little complicated. But the reason I show this picture is we had this on a poster at a presentation uh, university-wide, some science thing. And an astronomer came up to me and said, how many people know an astronomer? Yeah, guys look at telescopes all day. And he said, you know, that's really cool. And I just developed this software for looking at stars and how celestial bodies move through three-dimensional space. And he said, that reminds me of the sky and stars and celestial bodies moving in three dimensions of space. He said, why don't we use my software and turn my telescope upside down and put it on your confocal microscope. And now we can track the movement of all these killer T cells in three dimensions. And it was life altering for us to understand not only where they are coming in and out of the tumor, but where they were going in three dimensions and why and where they're going on the nutrient gradients and on the chemotherapy gradients within three dimensions. And that took us to being able to develop that whole uh, patentable thing because we ran into an astronomer, right? So this intersection of diff different disciplines is really kind of cool. Plus they're kind of fun to talk to. All right, All right final slide. This is my anti-work life balance slide. Um, I'll let you read that. I'm not gonna read it out loud. Uh, but George Bernard Shaw is one of my heroes, and I have this on the wall of my office, um, and I think it's important. That last sentence, um, I make every prospective faculty member I interview read, every resident candidate read, right? I, I think it's important to be your own incredible person. And I think it's also important to recognize that the world is not going to devote itself to making you happy. And that's your job. All right. So thanks for your attention for my ramblings. Yes, sir. Dr. Gibbs, thank you very much. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, your uh, your uh, life journey is obviously a, a great uh, 
mentorship opportunities for our residents. You're one of the few visiting professors that I can give a lot of UVA swag to ah, that you okay. might actually wear. Yeah. So uh, I wear it today. Yeah, right. We got got polos and everything for you. This is a good yeah. one shirt that I haven't given uh, Greg yet because I just haven't yet. So okay. maybe I'll give him one. So, All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for okay. having us, guys, joining us here. And yeah. thanks for the great uh, case presentation.